Gaming and BS episode 311. Coming to you Monday, September 22nd, 2020. Welcome to Gaming and BS, the tabletop RPG podcast. I'm Sean. And I'm Brett. Welcome to the show. Welcome back, folks. Sean, I screwed up. It's the 21st today, not the 22nd. <laughs> PC's like, it's the 21st. I'm like, that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm an idiot. Yeah, yeah that's, we don't need it. That's Dates. Brett's fault. I uh, I built the notes. Hey, thanks, COVID. Yeah. <sighs> How the hell are you, Sean? Getting a good gaming in? How did uh, you kick off Strahd yet? Anything cool? I, Nothing bad? So Nothing? You killed, did you, have you killed Jeff? Saturday in the, in the park. park. The, finished up Mothership. Eh. Okay. Man. I told him I was going to do it one way or another, so I finished it up. I narrated the ending, uh, and that was kind of it. I don't know if those, you know, like, okay. And then I said, hey, I gave him the option. I'm like, I could kick off Strahd today, or we could do Mothership. Any changes? No. Finish Mothership. And then I got him into Foundry. So I'm like, hey, it'd be a perfect time to get you guys in Foundry. To oh, show use, you. use a new tool, no pressure. Oh, I like that, man. I made up a world, right? That's how you got to create the world. Mm-hmm, and then mm-hmm. what I did was I brought in the Lost Mine of Fandelver and brought in that info. And then yep. I brought in their characters and then I dropped their tokens, loaded up a scene, dropped their tokens on the scene, which Very is a cool. map. And... They moved it around, and and the one person, <laughs> the one person that needed to see it the most wasn't there when we were dinking around with it. Damn it, Jeffrey, <laughs> that sucks. But here's the deal: no addition, no adding, nothing, no click no figuring stuff click out. Click button, dice are rolled, and you're done. You could take. A character sheet. So you have these. We can do that in roll 20. You take a 5e character sheet, hit roll, and it rolls yes. for you. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. That's one of the beautiful parts about online gaming, quite frankly. Yes. Yeah, tool, any kind of electronic tool that works correctly and punches through numbers. It's just wonderful. Carry on, though. Carry on, sir. Makes it actually easy. It's actually, it can be easier in Foundry. And, and frankly, you could do this in roll 20, but doing it in roll 20 is a pain in the ass. A little bit. In Roll20, you have to create a macro. So you open up a dialog box, and you got to put in the macro, whether you can copy-paste it in there or type it in there. Fine. And then it, you got to show macros. So you got to you gotta hit the button. You got to yeah. go, oh, show macros, and then it'll show a little button on your screen, and you could click it. And then it runs the instructions behind it. In Foundry, there's a tray at the bottom of your screen. Oh, you're talking about something. You drag stuff into it, right? You drag it. You drag your tack. Like, uh, my axe. And you drag your axe right into the square. So guess what? When you want to do your axe attack, you click the little square. That's it. Nice. What will nice. happen is it'll populate the chat and it'll say, roll with advantage, disadvantage, or normal. So then you click another button and then it rolls the dice. Or if you know the sh- keyboard shortcuts, you could do it with just holding shift, alt, or control slick. down. Slick, yeah. slick, slick. So... The, they're pretty stoked. Um, they love the dice because it's got some pretty cool 3D dice. Yeah, you said that last time. That's pretty yeah. slick. They're like, oh, I love the dice, man. That's pretty cool. Oh, those are pretty colors. And then they tried to crash my server by loading up like 40D20 <laughs> and roll them across my screen. Of course you do. Why wouldn't yeah. you? But it's, uh, it's a little laggy. Um, little. Because uh, they're all connected to my one Intel i3 CPU that's not got a lot of power. It's got a lot of RAM. My buddy and Alpha they're... actually built lag into his uh, Roll20 macros. Oh, really? Purpose. So nope. when he rolls, when he rolls, when Alpha rolls his character in my Avalon game, give me a, you know, give me a save, <laughs> give me a hit, hang on, click, it goes, bah, and then the number, 1001, 1002, flip, it pops up for oh, a delay. Geez. It's got a delay built in. It's driving Lenny bananas because Lenny can't figure out what he did or how he did it. Sorry, it's just, that's hilarious. I mentioned that. Now that the Foundry thing sounds cool, though, I like it. You I'm talked about you, it man. last time, and we've talked about it before off off the mics. I think it's worth digging into. Might be kind of neat. It is pretty slick, and I 
I showed them what I see because they don't they don't see right. They're like, and you know, yeah. So I said, look, see this. I click here, it comes up with the description. See the see for the map. If I click this little thing, which you guys don't have access to, if I click this little bookmark thingy, it pulls up all the keyed areas in each part well, quite, of the map. Quite frankly, the, the player tools in most of the online game gaming systems that I've heard of or seen are not that bad. The game master stuff is where the cumbersome is. And yeah. if this one is flowing for you, maybe it wouldn't work for me, maybe it wouldn't work for the next person. But hey, if it makes Sean's games go faster, that's awesome. Get out of the way. I like it. Yeah. I like so it. that I did. And then uh, Sunday, Hobbs was not prepared to run us through what he was going to run us through. So we played some board games on board game place. I don't know. Sean's probably like jumping up and down. Sean from <laughs> Tabletop Bellhop. It's the board game website where you can play board games on. It's actually really cool. I was Well, the guys impressed. I work with uh, is a huge board game guy, and he mentioned this to me in an email, and then I can't find the damn email, whatever it is. So, if somebody has the link to what that is, I'd love to throw it out there. Board Game Arena. Board Game Arena. There we yeah. go. Yeah. There we are. Yep, yep, yep. So, Brett, did you play this weekend? This last weekend, no. Let's see. No, nothing. Hmm. Was too busy hunting this weekend with AJ. Did not get out as much as we wanted to. Did you bag to. one yet? No, I did not. I'm actually behind. I had one. I had one last year by now. But that's okay. I'm blaming my nerve pain and the fact that I'm behind on everything because of that. <laughs> I pretty much lost the entire month of. August, which just sucked. Put some deer piss on you? Uh, not yet. It's not that time. Deer oh. piss is coming. That's uh, that's more towards the rut, and that's uh, middle October. So, yeah. I gotcha. So speaking Can't of that, wait. I, speaking of that, well, hey, we don't, <laughs> you know, we don't record in the same room, so what do you care? <laughs> so I've got a, I've got this crazy gaming story I've got to share with you, Sean. I don't think uh -oh. I've ever told you this. So. AJ and I are out in the ground blind, and then we're up in some uh, two-man tree stand doing some stuff together and trying to get him a deer more than me. So as we're driving to and from, he says, have you ever had anything that really like crazy, weird, funny, silly happen in a game? Because he was just talking about some crazy shit his friends have done. I said, let me tell you about the time Lenny's character got the nickname Shit Bucket. And he said, what? Let me tell you. So next run in this game, it's a D and D five E, and um, we end up on the wrong side of some githyanki. Like not good. We don't realize it. We we beat them, beat this small little cadre of them. Ah, we kicked the githyanki's ass. All right, woo, monster beaten experience points. We're happy. Well, <laughs> hmm, Nick had a pretty good thing going on there, and the githyanki are pissed. So they start attacking us when we're single or two or three, and we're like, okay, so we're staying groups, and we're kicking their ass, and we're staying like, ah, oh, fine, we're going to go find out where their base is, go beat the shit out of them. Well, Lenny's character is a young punk guy, and he lips off to the magistrate, and he gets himself arrested, thrown in prison. So his character's down there, no weapons, no armor, no nothing. Get the Yankee Knight shows up in his cell. And Lenny's like, oh my god, what am I going to do? He looks at me, because my character was being the old veteran, and he's the, the young upstart punk kid. And he's like, man, what would what would what would uh, what would your guy do? I said, grab the piss bucket, man. He goes, oh yeah, there's a chamber pot in here. Does it have like a handle on it? And Nick, not even thinking, goes, yeah. So let's think of it like you know, a three gallon bucket with like a metal handle. He's like, great. <laughs> and he picks it up and he makes this motion like he's swinging it around his head. Oh, no. He's like, fuck that guy. And he's swinging this thing. So he called him shit bucket for after this because he assaults the you know, get Yankee. Nick's rolling his dice in the open. He can't hit shit. And Lenny's rolling high. Wang! He pounds this get Yankee knight upside the head with this bucket full of piss and shit. <laughs> Wham! Stuff is flying everywhere. His character doesn't care. He just doesn't want to die. So he's flaying this thing around. <laughs> Eventually, Nick says, y y y you know what? The Gith Yankee leaves. He just fucking portals out of here because this is disgusting. And he just bailed. And AJ looks at me and goes, that's that's so vile. I say, yeah, but he lived. <laughs> I don't know if I ever told you that before. It was just No, I have never heard that story. 
It was one of those moments. I just AJ brought it up and it came back to me. And I'm like, oh yeah, that was one of those times when creative play, use of what's there, what's in this room. I got a chamber pot, don't I? It has a handle, does it? Yeah. All right. Start whipping it around. Centrifugal force, baby. Wang. And we all had this image of this wonderful Githyanki in his Baroque armor and his big blade. I will whack and his excrement flying everywhere. Yeah. The legacy of piss bucket was, was the born. Shit, shit bucket. Shit legacy bucket. of shit bucket. Shit. Yes. <laughs> Can't, yeah. Don't mistake no. that because there is don't a piss bucket yeah. and then there's shit bucket. They're yeah. two different people. Two totally different people. <laughs> I probably should have prefaced that if you are listening to it, this with the kids in the room. I apologize. That's should have right. started with that. but Pee bucket and yeah. poop bucket. Yeah, you knew the show was dangerous <laughs> when you started listening. So anyway, that's all I had. That was the closest thing I had to a gaming moment from this last weekend. But let's go on to Random Encounter before we devolve into, let me tell let's you about my character stories. Let's get into Random Encounter. All right. Random Encounter, segment of the show where we field voicemails, emails, comments from social media. Got We've got one from, we're going to kick it off with Todd Crapper from Broken Ruler Games. It's gonna, he, he, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> Here we go. Ready? All right. Hey, Brett, Sean, Todd Crapper here. I was going to actually start writing some of this down on the forums, and then I found myself getting so worked up that I just had to just, you know, turn the audio on and start recording this. Um, it's about the descriptions on demand episode. And yeah, I agree, calling it descriptions on demand sounds very intimidating and everything, but the issue that really kind of struck a chord with me, and I have not calmed down in the couple of days since I listened to the episode, was the comment that uh, some of the BSers were making about how they're okay with providing details on the campaign, the setting, or anything like that, if the game requires it, like if it's built, built into the rules. And... I can't help but think, even after a couple of days, what the fuck? Uh, it's like, <laughs> it, it almost just kind of seems contradictory to what I hear so many other players talking about. It. You know, it's it's almost kind of leading me down this kind of rabbit hole of what is it that's actually bugging me about it. And I think where it's coming down to is this kind of impression is that it almost feels like the game master doesn't get treated like a player in the game. And you see it so often in game text where it will differentiate between there's two types of people in this game, the game master and the players. And there just sometimes seems to be this mentality. And like I said, sometimes where the GM's role is treated like the host of a party. But in doing so, sometimes people forget that the host also wants to be able to enjoy the party, not just constantly running around topping up snacks. And their job is not to make sure that everyone else is having a good time. That is one of their responsibilities. But they get to be there to play the game too. Their role in the game is different but they're still playing the game. If sourcing the table in a way that works with everybody else, like everyone's willing to pitch in little bits here or there, uh, if that's good and that works for everybody, cool, you know? But it's like, I know for myself, there are times where it's like, I'm not sourcing the table because I'm trying to cheap out or it's just like, ah, I can't think of anything. It's more of like a, okay, Let's find something that's going to work for you so that I'm not forcing you to try and come up with a situation that might be outside of your cognitive space. So by asking you, you know, something about the tavern that you're going into, I'm giving players the opportunity to have some input so that they're not trying to find a way to force their characters into something that I've put them into. Because the characters are always the main variable in the adventure. Theoretically, if those adventurers are not there in that adventure, terrible bad things are going to happen. Um, so, but it's like, yeah, sorry, I'm kind of circling out, but going back to it, it's like, I kind of can't help but wonder if a lot of tables 
have actually wondered about this and maybe even discussed it in like a session zero. What is the role of the game master in the game if all they're there to do is just read the fucking adventure, enforce the fucking rules, and just do what the fuck we want? Now, just sit there and then top up my drink. So I may be completely wrong on this, but it is one of those things where hearing is just like, oh no, the game master is only allowed to source the table if it's built into the rules. Well, guess who just fucking built it into the rules, boys? The game master, when they decided that they were going to run that game and the player said, yes, I like playing with you. I like how you GM. Let's go for it. If it's something where being sourced for that is not in your comfort zone, totally understandable. It's up to the GM to work with that kind of stuff. But anyways, yeah, so I'm curious to hear your thoughts on this kind of thing. Damn, oh, man. I love it. That was awesome. <laughs> so when I, love, I first I heard love it, it, he's like, I've got this. And I just <laughs> got worked up about it. I'm like, oh, oh here we go. <laughs> Todd's a pretty even killed dude. So he's like, that's it. Two days later, you assholes are going to hear from me. <laughs> well, that's awesome. I'll tell you what, Todd. One of the things we have not talked about, we've talked about this in pieces, but we have not focused attention on role of game master, uh, role of GM, storyteller, DM, whatever it is you want to call them, keeper, guide, whatnot. There is um, is a role that a player takes on at the table, right? And um, if you comb through last six years of episodes, there are lots of times when Sean and I will say, or listeners will write in, I like it when, or I prefer when I'm running, right? I like it when the game master does so on and so forth. And a lot of people have different preferences and so on. But I don't think we've ever really sat down because, Sean, we've, we've gone through and said, hey, how do you game master, Brad? How do you game master, Sean? We've kind of picked at each other a little bit over the last six years of how we do what we do or what we like to do. Um, how we see ourselves at the table, you know, do you see yourself as the omniscient dictator? Do you see yourself as the, you know, uh, as a mutual player who just happens to have some, in, who happens to have the teacher's edition of the rule book? You know, I think it's, I think... Honestly, I think it's worthy of its own topic, so I'm going to add that in. I think it's worth coming back to because Todd had some pretty good points and funny <laughs> points, too, which I thought was awesome. I I think something's breaking down. I don't know if it's in my brain, if it's me, like if it's kind of like if I'm getting stuck in my own head or or not. But I, I, I find the Game Master being the orchestrator uh, uh, in my own personal group, especially specifically with Jeff. Like Jeff's the Jeff group, where it's, you know, hey, when are we gonna play? You know, somebody like posed the question, but it's up to the game master. And frankly, they gotta be kind of the one that dictates that, right? If they're not, it's there, interesting that we right? and we've talked about that when it comes to deal, dealing with problem players, right. problem game masters, whatever it is. A lot of times, people look at the game master, they look behind the screen and say, "Boy, I hope Ange fixes this." Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> when Brett's being a total asshole and everyone goes, boy, Ange, you're going to you're going to fix this. You know, and we've talked about that in right. the show before. We're like, hey, y'all are here. It's a team effort. We can all work on this together. Yeah. But it, it is interesting. The. The mystique, dare I say, the the level of importance or um, leadership either earned, feigned or desired that we thrust upon is foisted on to. Whatever poor schmuck we get to run the Star Wars game this year, <laughs> you know, it can get uh, kind of dicey. So, all right, Todd, we're going to have to throw that in as another topic, and we're going to add that in, man. Yeah, that's a thanks, good one. We've, Todd. Yeah, like I said, we've covered it curse rarely, but I think it's time to try to get in on it a little bit deeper. So, thank you, man. But I don't think the GM is a player. That's my final word. Final word. No, I'm Ooh. just kidding, Todd. All right, we'll talk about that when we poke, get together. Poke, 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 Todd. I'll, I'll fix him, Todd. It's fine. It just takes time. <laughs> All right. Uh, as, as penance for your foolishness, you may you must read the next one. Tom comments on easy wins. I think that if easy wins happen too often, then the GM is misjudging the difficulty level of the encounters. If it happens occasionally, that's good and provides an ego boost to the group. I think that even if an easy win happens against the big bad, it could be a good thing if it's due to excellent planning on the part of the group. 
an exceptionally good roll, or a fortuitous combination of attacks on the part of the group. A spell is cast that works particularly well in combination with another attack, for instance. That being said, if this was the actual end of the campaign and meant to be the real capstone fight of the whole game, then such an easy win shouldn't be possible. But it's up to the game master to make sure the big bad can't be taken down easily, even by good rolls and strategy. It's the GM's job to design the big bad to, the, to be the big bad, which means he won't be easy to take down. Exactly how the Game Master does this will vary from system to system. If they take him down easily, then the GM messed up. I don't have a good answer for what to do if this happens. You have to give the group something here, as long as you don't pull what I describe in my next paragraph. <laughs> what I have hated with a passion as a player is when we hit the big bad with a really effective combination of attacks with excellent rolls, only to have the GM say that he escapes anyway. We immediately, f uh, we immediately followed, only to be told, no, he's gone. When we pressed for how the only answer was, uh, it's a genre thing. He escapes. Oh, how I hate that excuse. What the hell? I do that all the time. I'm just going to be like, yeah, he got away. It's weird, Jeff. Just poof. Gone. That's nice. Yeah, and that's, that's why Jeff doesn't trust you, as we talked about last time. Um, <laughs> that's right. That's true. I, everything's coming together now. Everything's coming together now. <laughs> no, that's that's good stuff, Tom. I think sometimes. So, what Tom's laying out here, this is a really good. I, I like Tom's perspective, and I think that what he has in there makes a lot of sense for a lot of folks. I do know some people that, like my buddy Lenny, for instance. He, if everything goes pear shaped because of bad dice, he's like, oh well, that's how it goes. If everything goes colossally well. Because of amazing dice and everything is easy. It's like, hey, that's the game, man. So what? Don't care. That was neat. Won't happen again. Amazing. This. I was glad I was here when it happened. That's how he views that stuff. Not everybody's like that. <laughs> Not everybody's like that. Sometimes the big bad guy shows up and people are like, okay, this better be a big fight. A epi oh, what do you mean it's done in two rounds? Well, you hit him with a perfect attack, a one-two punch. You just destroyed him. Jeff Crit. Crit smited. Yeah. And sometimes people think that's cheap. They think it's too easy. They don't have a good time with that. It's, uh, yeah, the the random, no, he's gone, he escapes, it's a genre thing, that's garbage. It, that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't make sense. That had to have been built up somewhere else, I hope to God. Where like, oh, it's a cliffhanger, I don't know, some weird genre emulation thing, and it, it, it's happened before, you know? Where they're able to slip out a back door or something by spending bennies or something. I don't know. One thing I find myself doing more and more is as I watch TV, I picture how I would game master that scene. Yeah? You started doing that, huh? It's good for you. The w wife and I are watching You, which is like a, if you know what Dexter is, the old like serial killer who used to be like a medical examiner or, or yeah, doctor yeah. or something. It's kind of like, it's a younger version you of, of Dexter, a younger guy and- He's he's kind of a serial killer guy, and so I'm. It's on Netflix, but anyways, I'm thinking of like, wait a minute, because things in TV and movies just happen. Yes, there's no it may, like you could rip it apart and say, wait a minute, how'd that person just show up with no reason? Like they followed him and nobody knew, and but in gaming, it's like, oh, I detected somebody following me. Yeah. Right. They just didn't appear or show up. Like I'm, I'm thinking, like how would this go? But anyways, it's another tangent. But I tell you, man, doing that is how I figure out how to use smash cuts more and more effectively. Yeah. Things have to collide right now. I have to pull this in. It has to be super fortuitous that this person walks in at just the wrong time. Right. Right. It's a wonderful. It's a wonderful way to to figure out an alternate. I wouldn't have heard answers. Him, I wouldn't have heard it. Brett. Hey, I, I didn't hear him. Did, I didn't hear him coming down the hall. No, you can't. You, no, you, you didn't give me a roll. You can't. You're too busy. Your arms deep in this other problem. You never weren't even looking. No, I was saying I was at the door. I was at no, the door. No, you weren't. You weren't. I said I, I did say I was at the door. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the other thing is, in my opinion, watching that type of thing gives you these great alternate creative answers to the what's the most interesting thing that could happen right now. Yeah. Right. And sometimes you say, you know that so-and-so always wants to hear them. They're right at the door. All of a sudden, you tell them that 
you hear click, click, click of fast moving heels down the hallway and a rattle of keys. And next thing you know, they're in the door already. They're, they're turning the tumbler. Well, they get there so fast. They just, they haul ass down the room, man. What are you going to do? Why don't, you can stand here and question me or you can do something. What do you want to do? Right? So anyway, I just, I, I love that stuff. I say that because, and, and to, to bring it back to Tom or uh, to Tom's like, okay, how do I ham fist it, you know, a little bit. Right. Yeah, I hear you. So, anyways, thank you, Tom. Thanks for yeah. Me, thanks, Tom. All right, I'll read the next one. What we got? Bingo continues with easy wins. Sometimes people just don't want to know their characters can't kick some ass. They want to experience it. As characters gain level, players rightfully want to feel that their characters are becoming more effective. This cannot be expressed solely through fighting more powerful creatures. We can get a certain amount of satisfaction from knowing your party just defeated a foe they couldn't possibly defeat six months before. That satisfaction is very abstract. After all, the amount of stress and effort that went into the fight is about the same that went into the fight against weaker foes a few months before. So while the players know their characters are more powerful based on the foe, the experience is the same as it was before. That's why it's important to have easy wins, especially, but not exclusively, against old foes. Getting the opportunity to fight old foes at new, higher levels can be so much more satisfying because you have those old fights as a frame of reference. Facing three ogres that just trounce them it, excuse me, facing three ogres and just trouncing them is really satisfying when you remember that six months ago, the same challenge almost resulted in a TPK. It's also just fun to tear through large numbers of weak foes. It gives players a sense of progress, and of course, it tickles the thrill of power. Easy wins can't be granted all the time or players will get bored, but they have a place. Even better is facing weaker foes with some twist that makes it feel more challenging without actually being much more challenging. So again, setting up an easy win that looks harder than it is. I know as a player that I've always found it frustrating to get characters more and more powerful, but every single encounter is just as tough as always. You need the easy wins sometimes. I tell you, man, I think I've mentioned this before. I had a guy I used to used to game master for me quite a bit, John. And uh, John had this approach that every encounter was equal to the party. He wanted he had this, he had his own concept of balance. And the problem was Every fight, every encounter is a fight to the death, constantly, all the time. You walk into a room where 15th and 20th level 2nd edition AD&D characters, and there's a pink gnome standing in the middle of the room with a, with a chartreuse hat. Okay, I, that's an actual description. The pink gnome with the chartreuse hat can beat the ever-living fuck out of the entire party if we don't band together. <laughs> oh, <sighs> man, these ideas, I should just be writing these yeah, down. i got to is... listen to more of our shows. Yeah, this is, it's interesting for a while, but after room 100 of a mega dungeon, you're like, just fucking shoot me. Yeah. You know, everything's a challenge all the time. Every fight's a fight to the freaking death. Really, man? So he changed up. His style changed as he realized he was losing losing the audience, as it were. And that's a piece that I've learned from John over the years. Was ever, I look back and say, you know what? Not every fight's a fight to the death. Not every um, not every battle has to be this wonderful, you know, super dead nuts on. Now, oh my God, I think we skin of our teeth is the only way we'll get out of here. That gets old in a hurry. Yeah. So, anyway, good stuff though, Bingo. Thanks, thanks for writing in. Yeah, That's Bingo. I, I like the I like this outline. I think this basically. If anyone says, "Hey, could you sum up that show?" I'll just reply them, or excuse me, direct them to this re reply from Bingo because this is pretty much the entire show in two or three paragraphs, which is how most of our shows Indeed. can be summed up. But anyway, over to you, Sean. Laramie, this guy writes in comments on easy wins. A lot of good stuff, both in the episode and above. I feel easy wins dovetail into one of what I consider the most underrated elements in RPGs. And what was mentioned on the show after the Demi-Lich was wiped out. Morale. If the BBG or a BBG gets taken down, that's a game changed. I had a level boss in a dungeon get taken out in the surprise round. Sneak, attack, sneak back attacks, uh, prep spells, and ranged attacks. As soon as the room full of mooks knew the group was there, it was because the boss man was dead and the party was standing at the ready for the slaughter. The whole cavern just set down their weapons. And in my games, that's a successful encounter, full XP. <laughs> BBG is big bad guy. Big bad guy. Yeah. Thanks, Laramie. 
You know, Laramie, one of the things you mentioned, morale. Um, we've talked about that a little bit. I just mentioned it, right? Not every fight's a fight to the death. And it is with Brett. It is with me all the time. Every battle is a fight to the death. Um, I was explaining this to AJ and Lana a while back. We were talking about combats and encounters. And they had encountered uh, some bad guys in Middle Earth. And the Merc came on running. And they figured out that, oh, they could beat them into submission or they could get them to surrender. They didn't have to kill all the bandits. They thought that was pretty handy. They said, well, there's a thing that people don't use very much, and I never used it when I was a kid, was morale. Monsters, creatures, NPCs all had a morale. Um, your followers, who breaks, who runs. That's the old war game in that old design, right? Is that you looked at that and then you were rolling. And there were rules for when do you check morale ever after they've lost so many hit points or after so many of them are dead or whatever the case is. You know, it's that time sometimes when the goblins go surrender, they just drop all their weapons, throw their little hands in the air and beg for quarter, you know. But yeah, I think morale doesn't get used enough a lot of times because in a fight, the idea isn't always to beat the enemy to death. It's to get them to not want to fight anymore. Right. I mean, that's, I've heard war summed up like that. I've never been to, and I will not say I understand how war is fought in the reality of the world. But some of the statements I've heard people say were, you know, you win a war by making your opponent sick of war, where they can't not fight. Their will to fight is broken. And that's, you know, basically simulated via morale check in the old days. And that type of thing, I think, is pretty damn handy sometimes. Anyway, yeah, I would say that's a leading objective. <laughs> yeah. No. All right, man. If we pound the if we pound the crap out of them, I bet they'll quit. <laughs> yeah. Need to do. All right. Thanks everybody for writing and commenting stuff. on the forums. Todd, thanks for the voicemail as always. Um, let's get into the main topic, Brettster. Let's go. All right. <laughs> All right. Dominican posted this in our forums. Not sure it's the right place, but can you do an episode on how to GM for money? How to get that paper? How much to charge? What to expect? We talked about this a little bit in uh, it, when we first brought this up. And here's the topic. So I'm going to hit Sean with a gut check question here. Would you, would you Game Master for money? <laughs> I knew this was going to come. Would you? Would you do it? I don't. I would game master for money, but I don't think I would want to make it my full time job. So let me throw this at you. AJ wants wants you to run a game for his birthday. Uh, I say, hey, Sean, we run a game for my kid. You're a kid. Yeah, I know how much Brett makes a year. Damn it! <laughs> Damn it. I used to. I don't know how much. He well, makes no, well, I know it's more I, than me. Hey, so you also know. I also know I got a lot of kids, <laughs> and. uh Hey, taxes, taxes, uh, terrible. I don't hear that, Brett. I only hear one side of the story. Anyway, someone else, someone nicer <laughs> than me. Somebody else says, hey, kid. Will you, would you run a birthday game? And uh, you say, yeah, sure. And they go, hey, I, I, what do you want, like 50 bucks? I'll give you 50 bucks if you do it. Is that different? Yeah, I mean, oh, totally different. It is and different. that's like, a, is that's, that's a Midwest? No, 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 no. Both. I think it's both. So okay. one... I mean, and I, I've learned this through people that I know. There is the, hey, Brett, AJ comes to me and says, hey, Sean, would you do me a favor? I got a birthday coming up. Can you run like my dad, me, and my friends through it? Sure. What do you want? Nothing. Make sure it's make sure the, the beer is there and some knickknacks and we're yeah. good, right? Yep. But if you are... If you become what I would consider a professional game master, that you are going to charge people money to run, like, thing, whatever, then that's a different story. Then I think it's like you are engaging somebody to hire. So to throw that back at myself, would I do it? I think that for a raw cash, I would say no. I have no, no intention of being. No, 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 no. My general, my general thing, my gut check would be, "Hey, would you game master for money?" I'd be like, "No, not really. That oh. just it seems it seems stupid to me." Now, I would do it for fun. 
because it's a hobby for me and it's a good time. I'm like, oh yeah, I'll do it. It's fun. I've got time this weekend. Let's go run this thing. That sounds like fun. If I'm doing something like this for for cash, then it becomes an obligation or it can, can have this obligatory feel to it. And I worry personally that that would suck some of the fun out of the hobby for me. The other thing that this comes to me before we get into, do people really do this? Because yes, they do, boys and girls. Sean, have you ever game mastered long enough to get a free badge at a con? Yes. So you've gamed for money. Uh, I guess. If it's a hundred dollar badge, dude, that's a hundred bucks. Yeah, I suppose. So I, so I think though, it's kind of a barter usually, system, man. Like, exactly. You know, we usually see that as a barter thing. Yeah. And hey, beer. Pretzels, being at the table, yeah. right? Double cheese pizza. Yeah, yeah, yeah get, you order the pizza, uh, food, whatever. My game group has, for the Christ, for 30 plus years, if I'm running the game, which I had been for a very, very long time, I'd never bought snacks. I'd bring a drink, but everybody else supplied everything because there was like 7, 8, 9, 10, 12, 13 at one point. All these people would show up. And like you are providing all this stuff, this game master stuff, we'll take care of the food and drinks. Cool, fun by me. That was the little, you know, a bit of trade off. I didn't have to do that. When well, I go up um, this weekend, actually, I'm heading up to uh, see some of my friends and do some gaming. So I'll crash at Nick's place. Um, and when we run, somebody else will bring food and snacks and I don't do that. <laughs> It's because you're running. That's fine. If Alpha's running at his place, he uh, he always does like, hey, he's going to set up all this food. So we're like, damn it, Alpha, you son of a bitch. Okay, we're bringing beer. We got to bring this. We got to bring, what do you need? Well, I could use good. We plug him. We, we fill up with coffee. We, you know, set the stage. It's always a barter is how it's always been for me in the hobby. It's like, hey, if you're willing to game master for us, I feel like, then that's great. Sit down. You have enough to worry about. We'll cook. We'll take care of food and drinks. We'll make sure everybody's got a good time, has a good place to play, blah, 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 to show up, be your cool self and run for us. I've never thought about, you know, what the hell would I even charge? That's never even come up to me. And when we first hit this topic, Sean and I talked about offline, and I'm like, do people do this? Then I remember, wait a minute. I think um, our buddy Rob does this. Whelan? Yeah, Whelan has done it. And I know other people have there's a web, because you mentioned it. There's a website it. that has them. Yeah. So Sean, tell me more. Tell me more about it. You've done a little bit of homework on this. I, it ba And honestly baffles me that there's even a demand for it. That somebody would say, hey, I'll give you 150 bucks or whatever the hell. I don't even know what the going rate is. But if I said, hey, I'll give you a couple hundred dollars to run a game. I'm like, really? Oh, Okay. I, I just, it, it feels, I feel cheap. I feel, I feel like I shouldn't do that. Like it's against the, like some weird code of honor or something. I don't know, man. It just feels weird to me. But anyway, what did, what have you found out? So there's a website that's out there. We'll have it in die roll the link. It's called start playing. I came across it cause I'm like, I'll just, I'm going to just Google something and see like professional game mastering. And I found this website and I, I saw Robert Aducci on there. Uh, and if you don't know who Robert is, he does some uh, ale work. I think he does some production work yep. for uh, Misdirected Mark's shows. Um, and then uh, Chris Hussey was on there, and you know he's been on Fear the Boot, and he does some some Twitch uh, ga AP games. Big Savage Worlds guy. They were like I was scrolling through them. I wonder if I know anybody. Oh, look at those! Those those two guys. And. You can register as a person that wants to, like, hire somebody. They got a little bio, and I guess you pick, like, them. I don't. It doesn't say their rate or anything uh, that I know of, and I don't know if it's just a, hey, I want to, I saw your stuff on this website, and I was wondering if, if I could hire you to run this game. Chris Hussey. Yeah, for, yeah. for us, and, I, and then, they, then you start negotiating that. Um. So I, in my vision of this, having worked with a lot of independent contractors and things of that nature, entrepreneurs and the like, it, it, it's not, 
It's not any different than if you become a freelance X, a freelance Y, whatever it is. So you have, I think, what would you charge? I don't know. It's up to you. But I think that, I mean, I've seen, I think there's some rates maybe on there that are like, or even on Roll20. Somebody mentioned one of our people on the forums or maybe in the chat said something to the effect like they came back, went to Roll20 and didn't really kind of know they thought it was kind of part of roll 20 and so they just found a game and it cost five dollars and they said okay and they paid their five bucks i don't know if it was a i imagine it was a single session but i've seen games for 25 bucks and that's a four hour slot the thing is that you know you get five or six players that's 125 bucks that's four hours it's not a lot of money no, it's not. It, you know, you take out. This is this is not retirement no. cash. This isn't like you know what I could. Uh, hey, quit my gig and do right, this for a living. Right. So I mean, when you, and I say that in, you know, I know some trades people that do plumbing, electrical on the side, or they're independent contractors. Oh, yeah. yep. They charge like sixty bucks an hour, which is still fairly reasonable in in the U.S. In Wisconsin. I have always, I have always, when I have done anything that I've done professionally as a side job at some point. Like when I, I wrote some software manuals. Right. I charge a hundred I charge a hundred dollars an hour. Right. Because it's my free time and my free time is worth money to me. But there isn't now a that ton of is, gamers that, that are gonna sit down and go, I'm gonna yeah. pay you four hundred me, Sean, I'm gonna pay oh, yeah, you four hundred no, that, bucks. That's a di- that's yeah. that's different. Yeah. I mean I, I I Brett me paying I, Brett. Now you know if I wanna nah, have maybe Chris Perkins maybe. run something for me or <laughs> As a good game master, for Christ's sake, yeah, it can be worth anything. Um, do you remember the old Dragon Magazine days? Oh, yeah. It used to be in paper copy. Yeah. Hey, do you ever remember reading in the forums and the letters to the editor about the DMs trying to charge their players? Like, in the 80s. So this is not a new thing. Well, I think it's... So I think this the people that get... This has been around... Yeah. In a very for a very long time, of game masters saying, "I do all the work. God damn it, I should get compensated for this." Well, I think that's where the rub is. I, I know a guy that's in town here with us, Brett. Yeah, that that, that is. That's the approach. I do no, all the work. God he, damn it. <laughs> he's heard that before, and I think that rubs him the wrong way. Like, oh, that's bullshit. I'm just saying that was when. If I remember my old Dragon Magazines correctly, I remember reading through this and going, you have the audacity to charge your players? Right. Don't you? Aren't you doing this for fun? Well. You know, this is weird to me. And because these these guys were not talking about, and I'm saying guys quite honestly, because I don't remember any of them at the time being women. Um, but these guys were not saying at a con, a pickup game. The conversations I recall reading, and I'll have to go back and parse through my PDFs and whatnot and see if I can find them still. They're talking about like their regular group. Yeah. That'd be like me going back to my crew and saying, Lenny, Alpha, Zave, JR, Nick, Beta, I've been running for about 30 years, $5 a game. Let's say, let's say 10 an hour with inflation. Here's a bill. <laughs> That's a good way to get shot. Um, I, I, I just I can't see looking at my friends or anybody I've gamed with and said you owe me money for running a game. Now again, that is part of what was weird at that time was people saying I'm doing all the work, God damn it, I should get paid. But now we're talking about kind of a flip of, on this to saying I'm going to do all the work and set up a game for you to play, and I'm telling you up front that there's a charge for this. I'll be on Forge. I'll be on Roll20. I'll have all of this stuff set up. We'll run a four-hour game, five bucks a shot, blah, blah, blah. It, it, it's a session zero approach now, right? Saying, hey, I'll do this for you, but it is my free time. My free time is worth money. I have a skill that you don't have or that you want to participate in, you know. So maybe I'm okay with it in a way, but there's still – it's not – I there's – I just don't think it's for Brett, man. I just don't think it's for Well, me. I think that's the rub with, but, and so going back to Todd's voicemail and he, him saying, well, the game master's a player too, and there's a collaboration uh-huh. piece of it. Now you start throwing money into the circle. Does that change the dynamic? And I would say, hells yes, it does. 
totally. Now you, uh, wait a minute. Now I'm paying you land to landscape my my outside of my house, or I'm paying you to fix my plumbing. And if it doesn't work, well, I'm going to call you back. I've got re. It's called recourse. So if I hire a game master to come in and run a game, I'm going to have a certain level of expectation, especially if I'm paying them. So okay. So never. Hey, this is what I always say to some of my players: you get what you pay for. <laughs> I've said that bit. Whenever, whenever I hear somebody bitch about Facebook, I'm like, yeah, you know what you should do? You should call them and get all your fucking money back. That's what you should yeah, do. Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, hey, that's right. God damn that free service I've never paid for. Um, the other interesting thing is if you look at like Critical Role and stuff. That is a group of people bonding together to do a thing, right? There's people doing actual play podcasts. It's basically a troop of people, a troop of gamers performing. And they're doing this thing, blah, blah, blah. And they're that activity is getting netting than some cash in some way. So it gets spread across like, Oh, cool. Good for you. That's like a podcast, a patron or anything like that. Our patrons do nice things. They want to offer us some money to help support the show. Perfect. Wonderful. We've got that. We take care of our stuff, helps with our bills and the other things we've talked about before. Awesome. I, it feels odd to me, especially because of exactly what Todd talked about, which I thought was really timely for this episode anyways, especially is I show up and I'm only bringing me. And if you have a really good time at the table, it could well be because Sean is just a hell of a, a player. I am a moderate or average game master. Like you said, what what level of what am I expecting and whatnot? And what if it sucks because the other four people that I mean, you've been at, con, at gaming conventions Well, the game master seems solid. You and two other people having a good time and there's three turds at the table. Right? Or one turd at the table who's completely fucked up the whole thing for everybody. Or the players are all doing well and the game master sucks. And you're like, well, I you know, I could go complain to Gary Con this game master sucked. I'm like, uh huh, sorry, move on. You know, you're not gonna get your money back. But I don't know, it, it still it feels odd to me. Uh, um especially because it's so collaborative. I think you I think you can do it and I think you can make I think you can make a living if you hustle and I think if you if you live in a place that allows you to be able to to you so you're not going to make 100,000 a year and and no. pay off like if you in my opinion you got to hustle like a used car salesman no, I'm not into that either like, okay I got to do a lot of games like I got to I got you got to organize your shit you got to network. You got to market yourself. And you- well, there's there's that hustle, the sales end, of right? It. And then there's the please God don't burn out, right? Because if you're like, wow, I've got five games I can run, these five storylines, man, I could just alternate between them. You're thinking that's cool, and it turns out that three of the people who have played all five of them signed up for the next game because they really like you, and then they stop. Oh, yeah, then you'll get the review. Yeah, he's got five games. Sorry. It's either one through five. He doesn't run anything different. I mean, you're going to have to deal with bad reviews, all that crap. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to see if I could pull it off. I'm going to go on this professional, like, hey, you want to. Are you serious? Yeah, I'm going to go you're on gonna there. And I'm going to put like, hey, man, I get paid 100 bucks an hour and see if somebody bites. Are you serious? I'm going to see what happens. Can you imagine four hundred dollars for four hours times five, like two grand. Especially if you set the game up right, half of it's just players bickering. But with this each is other. this is one shit. this is one thing some people don't understand, and I've explored this because I've wanted to venture out on my own, and there's some things that I haven't been able to align here in order to make this happen. And it hasn't. It doesn't have to do with game master. It has some other thing that I'm doing. What what typically happens is we're very humble. Most people are humble. So they're like, oh, so if you ask somebody to do something for you, they either say, oh, it's okay, man. I'm going to come in and do you a favor. It's no big deal. Like, uh, you know, if I had Hobbs, so Hobbs is a big water softener guy. He works for a company. And I say, Hobbs, yep. will you do my water softener? He says, sure, man, no problem. And I say, great. How much do I pay? Uh, how much do you charge? And he goes, oh, no, it's for you. You know, No, no, I'm going to pay you because uh, I want you to do it right and I want to value your time and I want to pay you. So tell me what it's worth and I will, it's not a problem, whatever it is. So one thing that people do is they underprice themselves in some of their fields. So what happens is you say- No, oh, this is this is absolutely true. Just in personal note, I can tell you right now. So I have a number right. of different tattoos. 
And I have talked to tattoo artists after you get three, four of them from the same guy. He's like, well, I cut you a deal. And I always look at my tattoo artist in the eye and say, how much does it cost? And the last guy I was working with was Mike. He was going to do the yoke across my neck from shoulder to shoulder under my shirt here. And he said, well, it's going to be, I can't remember what the hell it was. He said, but I could probably, I said, Mike, that's what it costs. I said, if I don't have the cash, I will come back when I do. I'm going to get this done. But for God's sakes, don't short yourself just for me. Right. I'm one dude. This is a small town in Wisconsin, man. If you're losing money on me, then you're also losing money from the other person who's not in the chair right now. I said, don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. And I know myself, I will. somebody will say, hey, you're really good at what you do. For my day job, I'm like, well, you know, I try, blah, 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 which is a stupid self-deprecating thing that we all do. Lots of folks do because we're raised to try to be humble and not brag or be arrogant. When at the end of the day, you know, if you step back, go, I think I'm pretty fucking good at what I do. And then um, it kind of shows based on success and da, 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 da. Yeah, I'm good at this. That's a hard thing to say out loud, though. And um, when you put a and when you go there and say, hey, I'm going to game master and I'm going to charge five bucks, 20 bucks, 100, 100 bucks an hour or a game or whatever it is. You are putting your, you're saying I am at least this quality, right? If you say 50 bucks a game, 25 bucks a game. Well, you think you are. You think you're at least <laughs> this, right? So to your point, I mean, people will undervalue themselves naturally, yes. But there's a level of performance you've got to hit, though, man. I know guys that are in mastermind groups and they're they're very well connected and they're with people that are very well to do and they start out in consulting and they'll start out and they say, Well, I charge fifty dollars an hour for podcast consulting. The first thing they tell the person in their mastermind is you're charging way too low. You need to like double, triple your rate. Really? Because you're because then because there's also something to be said of all right, Brett, I'm going to pull up to your house and I'm going to get you this 2021 Harley Davidson decked out, fully loaded. Yeah. I'm going to sell it to you for five grand. That's insane. Why is it insane though? What? But here, it's five grand. Five I'm grand? just going to sell it to you. It's five grand. It's it's yours. It's, eh, it's you know, a $25,000, $30,000 bike, but I'm going to sell it to you for five. Yeah, my first thought is, uh, how hot is this thing? Hot? Is it really? It's is not it hot. really what I expect? It's, come on, Brett. Is don't it, insult is me. Is it really that I didn't good? Steal it? Yeah. <laughs> I didn't steal it. You get worried. You get worried if you're going to get quality. What's wrong for that. with it? What's wrong? What's wrong? With, with what's wrong with, it? with this thing? Is it a lemon? Is it busted? Is it stolen? You say it's not stolen. All right, give me the VIN. Oh, the VIN's been scratched off. That's nice. Yeah, makes you wonder. So there's a there's a balance and they say like if you get too too busy or overwhelmed you raise your rate it trims that off you get you get a different level of seriousness a different level of clientele you get you know we talked about that with gaming cons too right if you if your gaming convention you get a free con i don't have any you know oh i guess i could go but you don't have any investment that's why some cons charge for events or they charge for events or the admission cost to get into the con is quote unquote exorbitant for some right. people. And that's because they're like, look, this is the type of gamer I want to attract. And money is one way to do that. Yeah. yeah. It's a, it's a filtering which is, tool. Which is goofy because it, it is a filtering tool. And I can I get it from a businessy sense, but from the hobby fun, have a good time. Cause this is a hobby. I don't it's know. It's different just, when you're hiring it's, somebody, though. It is. Because you're is hiring somebody to it's come in and do different. all this stuff. Now, having said that, when uh, Dominican posts this, like, how to GM for money, I think the key factors with this is you have to run it like a business. You can't be game master guy who buys the game store just so that he could play his, yeah. his or her games in at a location other than their house, and then their game store sucks. Yeah, you've got to be pro. And by pro, that's acting as a professional. You have to understand your crew. You can't slip and do dick and fart jokes. If that's that's not acceptable, you have to have, these are standards. This is what I do. Um, got cost to cover. Like Sean mentioned, you know, you got to, 
you got a car that you got to get back and forth yeah. to. You got prep. You've got books that you have to buy. You know, stuff that goes. Do you have different? And do you do different rates for new gamers who've never done this before? Maybe you do. It depends. Super experienced gamers. I don't know. It depends who's doing, who's using it. And this is a piece I don't know enough about. Uh, you know, who hires these people? Is it? You know, I live in middle of BFE, and I, I need a, I need a hand. I can't. Ha- I don't have anybody to game with, or people who are brand new to AJ, it. AJ Chris, birthday party Chris, Chris, wants his no, dad Chris to Steele. play with him, not his dad to no. run for him. Well, I brought um, I, one of the reasons I brought the birthday party thing is Chris Steele, friend of the show, uh, awesome dude, all around guy. Oh, by the way, Chris and his wife just had their second baby not that Whoa. long ago. So congratulations, congratulations, you two awesome people, yep. great parents. But anyway. So Chris and I were chatting a couple years ago, actually, at GaryCon. He was at a gaming shop or something, and some mom saw him to like talking to the kids about gaming and whatever and said, hey, could you run a birthday party game? He's like, okay, sure. And she like tried to give him money. He's like, no, I'm not taking money for this. That just seems silly type of thing. And we were just, we were talking about it. He's like, should I have taken it? Do we get paid for this? Is this weird? You know? And at the time, it wasn't like... It was like, hey, would you do this as a favor? Sure. But what we're talking about here is if you're going to do this for cash, I believe you're absolutely right, Sean. If you want to do this, you have to approach it like a job. This isn't, it's your second job. Maybe it's your third job. Maybe it's a hobby job, whatever. But it's a goddamn job. You better be early or on time with the latest. First one in, last one out. That's got to be your mode, right? And you've got to give it and you got to give it your all. And you can't overextend yourself, which is another thing that we tend to do. Sean and I have talked about this before. Boy, we want to do this huge thing. We go, fuck, we don't have any time for that. You know, I want to, I want to, I want to. I don't have time because of scheduling. I'm getting better at saying no. But that's another piece is that if you really want to do something, you may have to, if you want to make a go of this and make it be a thing you do, you may well have to say, I don't, I run at cons and I, in order to promote myself, and the fact that I do this for a job and I don't run regular pickup games with my friends or I only do this periodically, it's go- it, may, it may well change your entire gaming dynamic. And that may sound hyperbole, but it could. It could uh, mess things it's up. A, it becomes a profession. And if you love doing it. And it's like, well, if you if you find something that you love and you can get paid for it, then it's no longer work or it's no longer a job. But the fact of the matter is, if you're going, in my humble opinion, is that you got to have your ducks in a row because there. The thing is with the money exchange that we're really getting at is there's a contract that's involved. That's what it is. Like I am paying you money, and in return, you are giving me. A service. Yep. And when you do that, you, you it's different. It goes different than barter. It goes different than I'm running it for my friends and they buy me chips or they bought me a module like from Forgotten Realms for me to run for them. It's a completely different ball game. And I think what you gotta do is you gotta have a contract that I think you go on this site, you register it, you have to understand your limitations, you have to find your focus and your niche. Like are you and I was posing this before you got on, Brett. I started saying, Hey, we're gonna talk about this tonight. Mm. And I said, "Hey, would you want to be, would you want to become a professional game master?" So, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then, what would you do? Would you run one? Like, I, my forte is D and I'm five E guy all day long, right? Or, or am I, you know, two or three? Like, here's my top two or three. You pick. Uh, this is my forte. Call Cthulhu. Are you Knights Black Agents? Are you whatever? You know, how much mastery do you have to have in each system? You know, who are you going to be running the game for? Are you, like you mentioned, do you, only, that. do you only play in person? Do you play online? Do you have an age limit? What are your What are your limitations? I don't want to run for kids. I don't want to run for whatever. Right. And then I think you have to understand the expectations of the person you're you're going to run with. So when you sit down and you're going to engage somebody to do something for you, maybe it's a wedding planner or whatever, and you're going to hire them, and nothing's been done yet, the wedding planner is going to want to know, like, okay, how how many people are in your group? Uh, is online acceptable uh, or I run things online. I hope that's, you know, if that's a problem, then we should probably just call it a day and have, you know, good luck. Um, also, I only run, fi- you know, you're you're also wanting to get a feel, telling them what you offer and then also understanding what their expectations are because you could certainly say, you know, oh, 
you know, maybe it's some weird kink game. I don't know. And they go, well, and you the go, other thing I, is no one sorry, to walk I don't away. do that. You, you, you've got to know when to walk right. away. You cannot be, and this is, um, corporations struggle with this all the time. What do we do for a living? I mean, that, right, that's, right, that's right. a who's legit your, question. Your They're co- customer. It's a legit yeah. question that corporate America has to stop every once in a while, reflectively ask themselves at the highest levels of the company is what the fuck is it we do for a living? When I took my job as, as the IT director, I pulled my guys together and I said, what do we do? And they talked, blah, 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 blah. I said, we sell boxes full of stuff. That is what we do. That's what we do. I sell a box full of other boxes that have stuff in it, or it's a can or something or whatever the case is. That's what we do. Everything we do has to be towards that. So a similar thing is like, look, if you're the 5e guy, if you're the old school person, right? If you're the Shadowrun master, any and all editions, if you're whatever it is you're doing, that's what you do. When someone comes up and says, hey, I really like that Call of Cthulhu game. Would you run Big Eyes Small Mouth for me? Sorry, I don't, I, I, I know. Or I could, but never read it, don't know it, don't own it. I'd have to charge an exorbitant premium for you. I mean, I could come up with a pricing model, but I'm telling you right now, this is not my forte. That type of upfront, because you're basically a con- consultant contractor at this point. Honesty, no bullshit. Don't hide because people are going to see it, whatever it is you thought you said you could do. I run a fully immersive game of uh, where dice are barely used, blah, 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 blah. You better hit the mark. You know, whatever your pitch is, whatever it is you're trying to do, you better keep it bullet pointy, keep it snappy, and keep it the shit that you know you can do, quite frankly. And if you get better and you expand yourself, that's great. But you will not be all things to all people. So, I mean, I'm not trying to be a douchebag and scare anybody off who really wants to do this thing. It's weird to me, but just, eh, shit, dude, lots of things are weird to Brett. That's fine. (laughs) I think, I think, so here's me personally, you can do... You could become a professional and get paid for anything that's out there as long as you're very good. Like, uh, maybe not even very good at it because some people suck at their jobs and they get paid. Oh, that, re- remember, somebody somewhere is doing a job they but, suck at. There is the world's worst brain surgeon. They exist. But there's, you know, a, just there's a level of, again, I'm going to give you money. There's an expectation. Now, there's a different expectation if I pay you, Brett, $5 versus paying Brett $500. So I think it's just a matter of understanding that concept and understanding what you are trying to provide to the people that are employ employing you to run a game or, you know. And if you think you have the ability to say, well, Sean paid five bucks, but Brett paid 50. I'll give Brett 50 worth of effort and Sean will get five. If you can honestly do that, kudos to you, because that's a level I don't think you can get. I, I don't think so. Maybe... You can, I mean, we've all seen that movie where a really good actor, like, wow, Robert De Niro, he's really good about something. You know, maybe you hate him or whatever, but if you really like Robert De Niro and go, wow, you see this movie, like, did he phone that thing in or what? Jesus Christ, it was terrible. He maybe did phone it in, probably didn't try real hard, didn't really Shitty care. Script, man. Maybe, maybe he got, maybe he got paid shit. Maybe he got paid top dollar, but didn't care. Hey, there's, there's a lot. When you're pricing yourself, this is a piece like, look, you know, are you going to put $5 of effort in or 50? And would you even know how to quantify that? Would you? I wouldn't. So, Brett, one person kind of poses this in the chat, and that is, what what do you consider professional? What's a professional game master? What is that? Some people would say that, hey, just I'm going to run a game for this group for uh, 20 bucks may not be a what can be considered professional. Yeah, I think that that's a damn good question because generally speaking, if you're getting paid, you're pro, right? In some way, it's a profession. You're getting paid for it. A professional gig got paid to do what it is you said you're going to do. Um, I think for me that I would define it as there's an expectation of some level of greatness coming from you, Right. If the deal is a barter setup, because essentially, if I think about it, my buddy's making sure that, hey, there's beer, there's chips that cover the that cover the pizza. Hey, we got brats. Hey, I grilled out. Do you want some money for that? Brett, come on. You ran the game, dude. You don't have to do that. That's really nice. It's super sweet. But 
that's also a thank you because they like what it is that I'm doing. If I wasn't doing very well, I'm probably not <laughs> probably not going to get to keep coming back for the last 20 plus years with these guys. Um, you know, at, at a con, it's when your game fills up really fast. Like, that's awesome. They just open the gates and my, my games are full. That's a cool. That's not a, but that's not a professional GM. No, it's not a professional GM. But I think I think it comes down to getting paid, having an expectation around you need to you need to. I don't know, man. Uh, you, you need to you need to hit a mark you somewhere. Do. And I think it's so. This is the thing with defining what a prof professional is in anything, honestly, because some people will be like. Oh, that's not a that's not being a professional uh, because you know they only do it like once a once a once a week for an hour. Uh, I think it depends on what they're doing. You know, if they're at a high level and they're only they're on, the only person in the state that does this thing, and they consult on it, I'd say that's a profession. Like they do it as a profession. I think sometimes people think professionalism as uh, consistency, mm -hmm. courtesy, ethics, acting moral. And I know people are like, what? But it's a job. Brett, you ever been in a meeting and somebody is unprofessional? Yeah, every day. Right? <laughs> but they're getting paid. Somebody somewhere. So they're, they're, but why do you consider them oh, yeah. acting in an unprofessional manner? So I say every day like that's that's obviously hyperbole. But I have um, I have been cussed out. Like literally called a motherfucker. Yeah. By a C level right. executive, that is no, unprofessional. Right. As you do not call me a motherfucker in front of 20 right. other people. That does not go no. well for me or you because then I quit and you're left holding the bag with a huge goddamn project. Um, uh, I have watched people dress other people down like that, you know, tear people apart. I watched a uh, C level executive make someone cry in public. No, that's bullying, so on and so forth. That is unprofessional. I've watched people lie. When you say, you said this, no, I didn't, and they just hold their ground. You, you have them caught in a lie, and they, nope. They twist, they throw people under the bus. It's not my fault, it's her fault. No longer is a team, right? But if you know somebody, Crush it, and you go, that's a consummate professional. It, when we talk about professional, it's, it's a... It's a it's a full picture kind of thing. Like it doesn't have to be just getting money or it's an attitude. It's a level of composure. It's it's and getting paid and doing well at something you, you know. So I think when you say a professional game master, that encompasses a lot of things. So when we sit here and go, just because you get paid doesn't make you a professional. Because you could get paid. That's very true. That's very, very true, I think. And not professional oh, totally. yep. to doing that thing. Right. Yeah, I think it. There's there's books and articles and seminars and YouTube videos out there around you know being con being a consultant. You know that's the type of skills you need. Just knowing how to run D and D is not enough. Maybe it is for somebody, right? But anyway. So I don't know. It's 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 one part of it to me. It's very easy to sit back here in my nice little comfy chair and lob. You need to, and this ought to be. And by God, you would suck if you didn't do this. I'm never going to pay anybody to run a game for me. Uh, never say never, Brett. No, it's not happening. Huh? You never know. Why would I? Why would I pay someone to run a game for me? What? What? You wouldn't pay. You wouldn't pay like run my own damn game. You wouldn't want. You want. Uh, so this is the nice thing about cons, right? You get to play with these nice, the great people that are like, yep. you know, if Ed Greenwood want, he was going to come in and run a, a Forgotten Realms game, or or insert like that'd be cool. Hey, and it's going to be for you and Lenny and Alpha Beta. Lenny hates Forgotten Realms, but I drag him anyway. Yeah, I mean, but if it was like a hundred bucks, no, I'm not paying that. It's not happening. A hundred bucks for a four hour game? That's cheap. I'm not doing it. Not happening. Now. Could happen. I mean, what if you're what if the what if the AJ said, Hey Dad, I want to play with you and Lana and this friend. And I want somebody to run a game for us. I call one of my friends. That's fair. 
That's fair. <laughs> I I get where you're going. I just I do not foresee a way that I'm going to pay someone to do this. I can definitely hey, see. Hey dad. Where other you people know what would I want? want to. I want you know what I want for Christmas? I want Chris Perkins to run a D&D game for us us four people. Do you think he would do that? Do you know Chris Perkins? Do you know somebody who knows him? Do you think he would do it? <sighs> and somebody knows him because you do know that. I and do know they so, say, I you know, a I know Chris him, yeah. is going to be in town around that time, and I know that he's he does some stuff on the side that he, you know, if you throw a few shuckles his way, he he may be up for doing that. You <laughs> pulled the kid card on me just to be a dick. Friend, yeah, no, I, I never pay. I get a friend to do it. I'll bring I just, up a honestly, scenario I, where you could think about it, Brett. I could think about it, but I'm like, oh my god, that'd be one of those cases. Where I'd be like, all right, I'd make the phone call, find out, and I'd be like, yeah, I can't do that. I go back to my kids and say, I it's not, it's exorbitant. We're not doing it, that. It, it might not even cost that much. I'm just saying, I if depending depending what it would be, I've said no to my children before. I started doing that when they were very uh. small. It's easy. It's easy to do. Oh man, I'm telling you, man. There, I won't bring it up, but there are times when those situations change a lot. I I understand. I understand. Yeah. And I've, if I'm wrong, when I'm 65, I'll tell you I was wrong. At that point, we got it. We got it recorded in four different spots. <laughs> like we're good. <laughs> Charity's another thing, though, right? Yeah. You do charity. Like I'm gonna run charity games come like probably March ish. Yeah. Yeah. For me. I, I, I get, I like I said, I, I get the, the concept or whatever. Part of probably what has a bad taste in my mouth is the the old argument that my friends, literally, my friends should be paying me. Yeah, that's, yeah. Right? I mean, I'm going to tell, I'm going to tell Jeff and those guys, look, here's the deal. You've been getting, you've been, you've been getting off for you've been free. been on this free ride for, how, for a long time. For how time. many years? Yeah. Yeah. A little sugar Sean's way. That's what we need. Yeah. All right. That's why sometimes I get bent out of shape about this crap when Jeff's pissing and moaning about something. I'll be like, hey, man, come on. Come on now. What do you want for nothing? Your money back? Let's move on. I think we've pounded this sucker here. Yeah, I think so, too. So if you are interested in becoming a professional game master and you would like some professional coaching or training in order to become that professional game master, we have professional game master coaches Dot com. Head over there right now, and for the low price of $99, we have a web site set up. It's online and course. Think, the first part of it is getting past Brett telling you, what the fuck is wrong with you? Why would you do this? This is we'll stupid. Get, we'll get, if you get past that, then you move on to Sean, who tells you how to be a consultant. <laughs> I'm Sean, and I'm going to be your personal, professional game master coach. I will show you how to become a professional game master in five easy steps. We got to get the dungeon bastard out of retirement and pull him into the shtick. That's what we got to do. All right. Let, folk, folks, I don't know what anybody else thinks about this. Is this a thing? Anybody, is any of our are any of our listeners doing this? Is this a thing people are doing? And um, I may be railing against something that has n- there's no need to rail against it. I, honestly, I don't give a shit. If people do it, they're like, hey, I'm having fun. Yeah, man, I make $1,000 a year doing this thing. I make $10,000 a year. Oh, yeah, it's really fun. I get to do that. Cool. I just, I don't see a need for me. That's fine. If you're doing it and it's fun, that'd be great. However, if there's a listener out there and like, yeah, man, Brett, you dumbass, I'm doing this. Tell us what you're doing, how you got into it and, and uh, how it's working for you. That'd be really cool because there's an, that's an insight I just don't have. Like I said, I'm, um, I probably have uh, old Grognard vision goggles on with this thing. But uh, I can definitely see it's it's a different world out there, kids today, and all that stuff. So let us know what you think. Maybe uh, Sean's probably right and I'm wrong. And I'm There's no right or wrong, that. Brett. All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then the die roll. Die roll, 2d4 miscellaneous points game and a geekery we want to bring to you. Uh, first one, start playing. I'm gonna, I'll put these out there. Uh, t- tabletop RPGs run by professional game masters. Um, if you haven't checked it out, by all means, feel free to do so. Uh, I don't think there's any cost to it. Um, although the the person that uh, I just dropped something, the person that I got an email when I registered and it was like, "Hey, I like to talk to the folks that register on my website 
here's my calendar schedule of time. So I'm like, interesting, interesting. Okay, maybe I guess I'll see where that goes. Um, yeah, AWOL, AWOL Trooper just registered a new game on Start Playing. All right, interesting. Anyways, uh, second one from Zero Rules on Twitter. Uh, we know him as Larry Hollis. From Nightmares, D100 ends unsettling items for sci-fi RPGs. Um, check that out. Especially if you're running something like Mothership or Alien or whatever. <laughs> Un- unearth such wonders as a warm thermos filled with fragrant coffee. It's, if consumed, texture is chunky and bristling with tiny bones. <laughs> oh, this is, this is uh, good. <laughs> this yeah, is good stuff. Number three, Jared Rasher reviews. Eat Man, this guy, he's just, we should put his own form up on our website. He uh, did another review uh, that he posted on his blog. If you haven't. Uh, I like Jared's reviews. I know I have I have had some people say, "Oh, geez, they're too long." Blah blah. I like him. I think I think he does a very solid job. So, King of Dungeons is what he did. Some folks uh, in our groups may want to take a look at. So check that out. Amongst any of the other articles, the guy's a writing machine, putting out a lot of content each week. Uh, the last one, Canadians game of D&D going for 38 years. This is making the CNN.com and the, the big major news outlets are picking it up. A gentleman's been running the same game of D&D for 38 years. I did not read the article entirely because, I mean, yeah, that's a long time, but is it he's, once it's not D&D. it's not D&D anymore either. Right. Well, right. He's created he's created his own rule set he says later on, but it's it's interesting. the other thing that's really cool about I love the fact that I have the same group of players for as long as I have. That is just awesome. And when you see something like this, you're like that's just cool. Yes, it's very nice. That's it's so cool. great. even Good even if, for him, yeah. Yeah. And it it's really cool for him. That's that is awesome. something to be said. Uh just but at the same time I'm like are you running like once a month? Like an hour, you know. I but yeah. kudos to him, of course. I know there's some other people that are doing just as long, or you know, that's crazy amount of time and dedication. So, yeah. Uh, all right, I think that is it for this episode. What are we talking about next week, Brett? Next week we're talking about GM and on the fly. The we insect. We're going to get on the insect. Uh, well, yeah, well, tune in. You'll find out, Sean. Uh, you don't read the notes ahead of time <laughs> anyway, so what do you know? The uh, teaser. <laughs> teaser. But yeah, we'll be talking about GMing on the fly next time, so that should be cool. GMing on the little, the little insect. Yes. Yes. I can't wait. On the fly. All right, let's get out of here. It's getting weird. Hey, for Gaming and BS, I'm Sean. And I'm Brett. Good night and good game and all. This episode of Gaming in BS produced by the following BSers. Graham Minert, Corey Wynn, Aaron Raylia, Curtis Takahashi, Joe Swick, Rich Wishon, Merkel Froelich, Corey Welsh, Brett Pazinski, Ed Nyes, Adam Grotejohn, Josh Wallace, Chad Gleeman, Quigley, Quigley Malcolm, Larry Hollis, Obscurus Dominus, Isaiah Aries Christian, The Duke in Purple, Jay Plata, Phil McClory, $1 Adventure Frameworks, Jason Weeb, Daniel Garrett, Jim Ingram, Curtis Hinson, Mike Hess Jr., Ghost GM, Mark Soam, Hus Carl, Hus Carl, Eric Telvola, Henry Newcomb, Melissa Bashinsky, Harrigan, David F. Baylog, Brian Rumble, Jeff Goad, Corey Gonzalez, Niall Diamond, John Kayward, Andy Olson, Eric Avia, Perry Besor, Laramie Wall, Brian Kurtz, Robert Nemeth, George Sedgwick, Eric Salzweedle, Angus, Jeff Seifert, Howard Bishop, Craig, Sky, Thomas Hook, Mark Richmond, Jim Fitzpatrick, Old Scouser Roleplaying, Ron Bishop, Craig Huber, Dan the Valley, C.W. Mellencamp, Pure Mongrel, Mark Tasaka, Stefan Dragonspawn, Tony Sugarloaf Baker, Eric Frankhaus, Larry Hout, Chris Deal, Roger Braslick, Andy Hall, Jason Hobbs, Old School DM, Ray Otis, and Jared Rasher. Hey! If you liked what you heard on this episode, be sure to tell somebody. Have them go over to GamingNBS.com and have them subscribe. Thanks, BSers. This, this has, has been, been a Litterbox, Litterbox Studio, Studio production. production.